Hello and welcome to this service of online worship from St Mary's Chalkham and St Stephen's Lansdowne. I'm Philip Hawthorne, the Rector, and it's great to welcome you together. And you are together, although you're in different places, watching at different times. God's Spirit unites us as a body of people worshipping through this offering. I'm in neither church, as you can see today, I'm in my home. Um, and Jesus says, uh, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And this is the place where I pray, I come to pray. And um, I wanted to be here because, as you'll hear from the reading and then what I want to say about it, we're looking for the simplest place, the simplest place to start, the smallest place. And that is here for us today. So welcome. We're going to be thinking about silent prayer today, uh, among other things. And we're going to start with some quiet. So I'm going to sound my singing bowl and we'll just, maybe you can just hear when the singing stops and the silence starts and we'll have some quiet together. say together the words in the description. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There are other bits of the liturgy in that description, which you're welcome to look at or not, just listen to the words if you'd prefer. So our readings for this service, the first from 1 Samuel. Then Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was very sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? Saul hears it and he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name for you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see mortals as they see. They look on the outward, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had a beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. 
and then from Mark. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. If you're local to here, I don't know if you went to the Lansdowne Open Gardens last Sunday. It was amazing as ever. Though try as I might, I can't help feeling that thorn of guilt when I compare these beautiful gardens that are open to, to our own here. But they did get around, did, did get me around another battle I've had, and that's with tomatoes. I'd normally have some on their way by now. I love the San Marzano variety, especially the big plum tomatoes that you can get. But I got in there early and in the Millennium Green bought some plants, so uh, everyone gained in the end. And looking at the readings, especially the seed gospel, it's not hard to see why I started with that image of growing. But we've also been following the story of the first king of Israel, Saul, how the Israelites asked Samuel for a king to make to rule over them, an earthly king to rule and to win their battles. And how even though God warned against having one, God helped Samuel find one, which was Saul. And last week I gave a, a, a spoiler. Saul wasn't all he promised to be, and even God regretted having chosen him. So this week we read about Saul's successor, with God once more in control of the choosing, and maybe doing a little better this time. So you heard the parade of sons is brought before Samuel, Jesse's sons. And Eliab looks like the perfect king, but God says, nah, he looks good on the outside, but I look on the heart. Then Abinadab, nah. Then Shammah, nah. Then four more pass, this one, Nah. This one? Nah. This one? <gasps> nah. And finally the last one. Nah. Or was it the last one? Is that all your sons? asked Samuel. And Jesse says that there's another, the youngest, but he's keeping sheep. Obviously the least likely to be chosen. It always reminds me a bit of Cinderella, that bit with the slipper. So the last, the youngest, is brought to Samuel and he is the one. And Samuel anoints David. David of Goliath and the Psalms and the Bathsheba affair and her husband's murder. David of Jesse, two of the direct ancestors of Jesus. So in election season, it's been manifesto week. And I've been reflecting on how each day on the news, it's like the parties have been parading their promises before us. Which one? This one? Mm -hmm. This one? And how the policies are presented are actually responses to the narratives set by the powers that present them. Narratives of growth and success, of accumulation of wealth, of strength. At its basic level, Many people expect policies that promise better lives without it costing us any more. But I heard a very different narrative on Wednesday. I went to some talks by the Reverend Dr. Sarah Bachelard, who leads a contemplative church in Canberra. And she spoke into the way that we and the church respond to society's agendas. 
she talked about how the rise of mindfulness and meditation are often made popular as a response to the stress and the noise and the demands of the world. But she said how actually contemplative prayer or meditation should be what we seek to do to be because it is holy in the flow of God, in whose name we meet, by whose creativity we live, and in whose love we become ourselves and make God known in the world. She talked about how the deeper God's presence is in us and our communities, the more we are not just responding to the familiar system, but we're living a radical alternative to it. She calls this ensouling the system, mysticism as resistance. And she says that it profoundly enters the mind of Christ, learning to inhabit a dangerously different world that if we let it, will change everything we encounter in the world of familiar daily experience. A witness to the compelling strangeness of a new world in which it is possible for the corrupt, unjust, fearful and greedy culture we take for granted to be challenged if we could only stop and unclench our hands and our hearts. This for me gets to the root of what prayer and worship is. Last week we reflected on about letting go with God. And this week it's an opening up of hearts and lives to a different story responding to an alternative narrative and even having the confidence to set a new one. The afternoon talk she gave was called Contemplation, Poetry and the G Word, which was God. Poetry over descriptive prose because it leaves space, it engages the imagination, it involves us. It doesn't explain or tie up loose ends or provide all the answers, but it gives us a fleeting glimpse, an inkling, a sense of beauty and of God. It really celebrates those gifts of imagination and wonder that are part of our created being, part of the image of God in us. And I love this because it's what Jesus did. In the gospel we read, Mark says, he did not speak to them except by parallel parables. He makes strange what we already know well. A parable leaves space. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And it's the space itself in which the meaning is a possibility, which grows. We're not just told it, we collaborate with God in finding out what that means for us. And it's often not just one thing. It's an image sown in the fertile soil of our hearts. It fills the space and it produces its own fruit in our lives. And it's key that I said hearts and not minds. Parables aren't about a list of instructions and understanding, wondering if things are right or wrong, but about living from the heart and it's in opening the heart to the poetry of Jesus' teaching that we start to do this. Because all that Jesus evokes in the image of the mustard seed as the kingdom of God resonates because it's in us. The kingdom of God isn't a manifesto. It's not a system that either functions or doesn't. 
It's a state of being. It's all the possibility of a life to be lived fully. And it's in the depth of that prayer that we can begin. So we can see how Jesus presents a picture for the results of that seed growing in us as we seek to live in a way that is to our world produces what a tree does. The roots, they form something unseen that sustain us. They provide nourishment and they hold the soil of our grounding of our life together. And in all the changes and chances of life, we become the sureness of God's presence and our lives can draw on the deep creativity of God. The tree's branches give shelter to the most vulnerable. They provide a place of shade, of safety and of rest. And it's in this refuge that life could be nurtured and a new life emerge. And the branches are not bolted on to the trunk, but they're integral to it. They grow out of it with the strongest connection. A reminder that all things are connected in God. From the biggest to the smallest twig or leaf. And the tree produces fruit. Fruit that feeds, fruit that contains the seeds to carry on the life and the love of that tree. It's such a rich image of how we live. Depth, beauty, fruit. And of course the kingdom of God is many other things. It's not defined by a tree, but it's evoked. But the whole meaning of the parable, of course, is in the size of the mustard seed. The presence of God planted in the world grows, says Jesus, from the very smallest thing in which is everything that it needs. The meaning is not in its defining, but how it resonates with us. It makes a shift in our imagination. And in that shift, we become what has not yet been revealed. And finally, a deeper level to that image that we ourselves bear that seed of the kingdom, that we see the smallest thing which becomes the tree of our experience. And that smallest thing in us is the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in the sacred, the simplest place at the very core of our being, which is, in fact, the most real for us. And this is the fertile soil of our prayer. And the smallest mustard seed prayer we have is silence. The space that we embrace in our lives away from words, away from the usual narratives, where we seek God in the purity of silence, God's first language. The contemplative taproot of prayer sinks to our very soul, our spirit, where the image of God is planted deepest in us. Beneath the images of ourselves that we want to project, deeper than all our failures and regrets, deeper than our need for easy answers.
and our branches are how our prayer enables us to reach into every part of our life and our life in the world. All things connected, all things carrying the sap of God's presence. And the fruit, the way our prayer life is the fruit of God's spirit, is for us to be kindness, to be compassion, to be joy, to be peace and to be love in our own lives and in the world. And the deeper the source of our prayer, the more intentional we are at finding God in the silence and in the space, then the more fruit of God's kingdom can grow. So this is the seed of the alternative narrative, space over words, seeking over answering, possibility over certainty. That's what faith is. Blessed are the humble in spirit. Blessed are the curious. Blessed are those who ask questions. Because as Sarah Bachelard said, asking the questions in every space you move through changes every space you move through. So may you question the familiar narratives and choose prayer and being, not the loudest and biggest, but the smallest, the most hidden and spacious. And may you choose, as Sarah Bachelard encourages us, to inhabit a dangerously different world, that if we allow it to be sown in us, will change us, our church, and our world, and nothing less than everything. Amen. I'd like to just stop the video for a bit and just spend some time reflecting on those words. There's much in there. I'm not sure I completely understand everything fully. That wasn't the point, I suppose. So we affirm our faith. With the whole church, we affirm that we are made in God's image, befriended by Christ and empowered by the Spirit. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all creation, we celebrate the miracle and wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God, forever at work in ourselves and the world. Let's pray. Thanks be to you, O Christ, for the many gifts you have bestowed on us. We bring to those we know need your comfort, your healing, your presence. To Gabriella, Sally Pym, Bob Carlton Porter, Caroline Kay, Rosalind Marshall, Mike Clare, Tory Peters, Elizabeth Moore, and Simon. For Bridget and Brian and Mary Young, for Paul and Caroline Chaudwag, Simon Marshall, all those who have communion at home. For my family and for Andrew and his family in our various difficult times. And we continue to pray for those who lost their loved ones recently, Christopher Joel and Liz Jones, 
and in some space, bring those on your mind and heart into God's loving presence. We offer to God the life and mission of the church. May we be strong in that narrative of God's presence, the power of love, of vulnerability. We pray for the world and all its troubles and places of anguish and fear, of injury and exclusion. Remember especially Gaza and Israel, Ukraine and Russia, Syria, Sudan, Yemen, for refugees. Pray against the rise of hatred and anger in politics. And we bring ourselves to God, individually and as our church, that we may be authentic in our worship and our living, that grow in generosity of spirit, in openness of heart and warmth of affection. As we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us in our room with locked doors our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen Great to be with you. And we'll finish with the last bit of liturgy, which comes from the Iona community. But have a really good week. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will not offer to God offerings that cost us nothing. Go in peace to love and serve. We will seek peace and pursue it. In the name of the Trinity of love, God in community, holy and one. Just a reminder that next weekend, uh, 22nd, is when we have our charity abseil of the Tower of St Stephen's, which I shall be joining in with in my robes, and also our summer fair at St Stephen's as well. An advance notice that on the 6th of July, there is uh, a tea party in the garden of St Mary's. Bless you.